topic. Uh, for those of us who did a tour of the water, so we'll uh, work into that. So, so Dr. Schuler, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Carl, for the opportunity to talk today. It's nice to see some Megan, my former student here. We've been expecting to see familiar faces here. Um, yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. I, you know, I checked out your website. I what, what the concept of quality isn't part of my training at all, so I've done my best to kind of make this appropriate for the audience here. Um, other than we always talk about water quality, people ask what I do. I really do wastewater treatment, you know, sewage treatment, and uh, I usually don't want to bring that up at dinner, so I always say I do water quality, right? So that's my main link. So um, this is a talk I made just special for you guys, so I, I haven't given it before. So. I was, you know, searching around on your website. You guys know who these guys are? I'm curious, like, what's your level? Is this like, these like the gods in your field? You all know who they are? Okay, yeah. So, um, yeah, I was, I was kind of wondering about, like, right, what is the con definition of quality? And this came up. You guys have a link on your website with a bunch of definitions. And uh, you know, Joseph, do you pronounce that Juran? Juran. Juran. Oh, controversy. Big choice. Okay. <laughs> Joe. Uh, described it as fitness for use, whereas Philip Crosby described it as conformance to requirements. And one of them is obviously sort of very functional definition, and one is for like you lay down the law and do you, do you conform to that, right? And I think that very much applies to water quality. So, when we think about water quality, we're talking about water, right? So, you think about pristine water, H2O. One definition could just be H2O, right? It's the absence of anything else. Pure water, right? So you can go down to Walmart, buy that for, I have a price on there? Yeah, about you know, 50 cents a liter, you can get pure water, or you can install an RO unit under your sink and get pure, pretty darn pure water out of that for a lot cheaper, right? But is that really something that you want to drink? A lot of people do want to drink that, right? Um, but it actually doesn't taste all that great. Um, it's flat, right? It's like other well, people will pay money for Perrier, right? And that costs you about two bucks a liter, and that's to have all this other stuff in it. You know, hopefully they advertise these like natural minerals, like you can, you know, obviously get the bottled water from many different sources, and they all make the claim that it's, you know, this great glacial water that took 10,000 years to make, and it's got <laughs> minerals in it. You know, and but you know that's in your tap as well, and that costs about you know, a tenth of a cent per liter um, for you. And according, you know, studies done, the environmental working group came out that about 44% of bottled water is just tap water anyway, right? So do you really want to spend that money? Um, you think about Perrier, you know, the, the ludicrousness of it is, is kind of interesting. You know, you've got, they're pulling water out of the south of France and they're um, transporting it, storing it, they're carbonating it. <laughs> it's not naturally carbonated. I looked on their website and their uh, claim, it used to be naturally carbonated, but now they take gases out of the same subsurface and then they inject that back into the water to carbonate it. So <coughs> they're making the claim sort of the naturally occurring gases as well, right? Rather than just manufacturing CO2. Sometimes a lot of little flavoring, some bottling, some packaging. This is off of their website. At least they're being honest about the carbonation. Um, then they throw it in. You know, right now, coming across the Atlantic Ocean are big freighters full of water crossing the water, right, and bringing it to you to buy at Walmart, right. Um, so you know, obviously that's not the the best use of energy, right. So energy use production of bottled water might be two thousand times more energy intensive than just tap water, and. You know, it's sort of extraordinary the amount of energy that goes into that. What does that 2,000 get you? About a quarter liter of oil for a liter of bottled water, right? So one website I saw described that as, you know, just imagine that liter, a quarter full, filled with oil, right? So you got your choice. Do you want a quarter liter of oil or do you want your little bottle of Perrier, right? Most of that is for production of plastic bottles, the PET they use to add for transport. So the huge, the energy, you know, the monetary costs may not be that high, but the energy costs are, are quite high, and that's because energy is so darn cheap, right? Okay, so I'm kind of thinking more about this water in a more traditional sense, thinking about the water that we use. So when you think about water quality, 
what we consider quality water will, of course, depend on use. You know, if you're going to drink it, that's one thing, right? But we use water for a lot of different things. Um, uh, here would be what the public supply would be the purple here, and these are in million gallons per day of flow, which is the common units we use out of a drinking water plant. It was cool. I saw you guys actually did a tour of the drinking water plant. Who in this room go on that tour? Yeah. You see Megan? Is that where, where's your office? Is your office uh, out there? Like the Oh, okay. All right. That's the other. If you ever get a chance to do Megan's tour, go out to the wastewater plant. That's a much cooler tour. I didn't know. Have you? Yeah. What is aquaculture? Uh, aquaculture? That would be. Uh, I mean, is it? No. Okay. Uh, I believe that that would be. Oh, that's fish farming. Right. That's what? Fish farming. Fish farming. Like. Uh, How is that different than irrigation? Uh, well, I guess you could fold, fold it into irrigation if you want a tour, or you could fold it into like, you know, livestock, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? But they've broken it out separately. I assume it's freshwater ponds that are made to make trout and whatnot. I don't think you could have, if it was a, sometimes it just net off a piece of the ocean and raise salmon in it or something, but I don't think they could track the water used for that. Um, so, anyway, well, I was just going to say, too, the wastewater plant tour is much better than the drinking water. Just more, it's more interesting. There's more going on. I, take, I always take my students on both tours, and the, the drinking water plant tour, it should be boring, right? Because the drinking water plant should be very controlled. Wastewater plant, it's a little bit more wiggly, right? There's stuff going on, there's people running around. All right, yeah. <laughs> there's more to do at a wastewater plant. So, about 12% of the total, this would be total withdrawals in the U.S. So, about 12% would go into public supply. The big bear here would be 46% going into thermoelectric power. <clears throat> What's not shown on here, however, is, and then irrigation would be a big one. I didn't calculate the percent, but I don't know, it must be about 35% or so for irrigation. Right? What's not shown on here is the idea of consumptive use. Okay, so a lot of times we talk about, you know, there's this huge amount being used for thermoelectric power, but that's for cooling towers, right? So, you know, suck up the water, use it in the cooling towers, and then they discharge warm water right away. So the only damage to the water really is just raising the temperature a few degrees. So it doesn't really need a lot of treatment, but it needs to be reasonably high quality so you're not having a lot of scaling in your tower, right? Of course, the public supply, that would be the highest quality of water that we need because we are worried about getting sick. So this is kind of another way of breaking out the same information just if you're interested by state. This is kind of a nice little report put out by USGS every five years, but I guess the 2015 one hasn't come out yet. And they've ordered the states from the western states to the eastern states. And the yellow here is thermoelectric, and the kind of aqua color is irrigation. So you can see how in the west it's really dominated by irrigation, and on the east it's really more dominated by thermoelectric. Okay, so Zooming in on that public supply element then, for drinking water treatment, you guys have been to the plant, you know, you're trying to get from here, Rio Grande, to here. So what do we need to remove? So this is water treatment kind of 101. For wastewater treatment, we're now going to take the used water, sewage, and we need to get from here to something we're willing to discharge to the environment. Right? So totally different set of water quality. <coughs> parameters in either case. So I'll kind of focus on the drinking water part. So the first thing we worry about with drinking water is of course disease, but it wasn't always known that drinking that that, that drinking water could be a cause of disease. Um, going back in history, it wasn't that long ago, you know, the 18th, 19th century in the 1800s, it was believed that um, during the cholera epidemic, for example, the Black Death, it was caused by bad air, right? So miasma it meant bad air. So you we were supposed to avoid kind of smelly, stinky places, right? Which is, you know, not a bad idea anyway, right? Um, and similarly, the word malaria comes from bad air. People didn't understand that it came from mosquitoes. But it kind of makes, you know, if you have standing water around, that's going to be smelly. It's also going to breed mosquitoes. So, you know, it leads to some rational behavior, but... <laughs> Not always, right? So, <clears throat> anybody that hasn't taken one of my classes, like Megan, can you name this map? You know what that is? 